Hello everybody, welcome to our first exercise in module 15, a multiple linear regression. Now, I assume that when you look at this problem, it probably feels very familiar to you. It looks similar to the exercises that we did in module 14. And there's good reason for that. There's a lot of similarities between module 14 material and module 15 material. Module 14, of course, you recall, we only had one independent variable. Now we can have as many as we want. And here I can see just by taking a quick glance at this, I have here four independent variables. Now this problem again, is dealing with one of these incomplete or a partial output taken from Microsoft Excel. All of the relationships, all of the calculations that we did in those module 14 problems, they all carry over to module 15. They're all the same relationships between all of these different cells within this output. There's one fairly major difference though. You might notice that for this module 15 problem, I'm not actually giving you the data set. Module 14, I gave you a data set and sometimes it was useful, sometimes we didn't even need it. For module 15, no data sets. And the reason for that is that in order to do the calculations by hand, if you wanted to calculate from a data set, any of the partial slopes, we would need to use a tool of mathematics called matrix algebra. And for my course, that is not a prerequisite um, type of mathematics that my students have. So we are not going to be calculating coefficients from a data set. So I'm not giving you the data set. It's not going to be of any use. But as you can see here, well, we have a few coefficients that we have to figure out what they are. Well, just like we did in the module 14 problems, there's other ways that we can get those coefficients using the information that is available. And so that is what we're going to be focusing on. And then we will have our estimated equation, we'll focus on some interpretations and some measure of goodness of fit. Okay, so let's jump into this exercise. So here we have an estimated regression equation that states that that's a mistake. This is not actually estimated yet. And this is just our regression equation that states the quantity sold of a good is a function of its own price, the price of related goods, advertising expenditures, and average household income. So this is the regression equation. The estimated regression equation, the reason I scratched that out, because the estimated regression equation is what we're going to obtain when we go through this process. We obtain the estimated regression equation. So here's that regression equation. I've got my quantity demanded, a function of its own price, the price of some other good that's related, and those of you that have taken an introductory economics course, you're thinking about complements or substitutes, advertising expenditure, and household income. Prices are measured in dollars. Advertising and income are measured in thousands of dollars. So we have to keep that in mind. Those are the units of measurement that we have to keep in mind when it comes time to interpret our coefficients. The following table provides the estimated regression results. Okay, so here we have our Excel output. Now, first thing that we are going to do is fill in the blank. So just like the module 14 problems, we have to look at this and figure out, okay, what do I have? What ingredients do I have to work with and where can I go? As I said then, when we were doing those problems, there's endless different types of questions that your instructor might ask on these types of, of questions. The way that you have to approach them is always going to be a little bit different because they'll always differ based on that starting point. And then you'll have to find what is that path to completion. So what are we going to do here? Well, I always like to start 
in the regression statistics and start right up at the top and just go through line by line and ask myself, can I get this yet? Can I get this yet? Can I get this yet? And we'll go from there. So the multiple R, that's the coefficient of correlation. I can't get that yet. That needs the R squared and I don't have the R squared. I can't get the R squared yet because to get the R squared, I need sums of squared. I need SSR, SST, these things. The adjusted R squared, well, that's something new for multiple regression that we didn't have when we looked at simple linear regression. You probably know from your lectures or know from your textbook that adjusted R squared is one that provides a penalty for adding variables to your model that really fail to contribute anything significant in explaining and capturing the variation in your dependent variable. We know that the R squared, for example, is SSR over SST. Well, SSR is the sum of those squared deviations, those differences between your predicted values and the mean, divided by SST. And so the issue comes up when we realize that as soon as I open the door to adding multiple independent variables to my model, the R square, which is this measure of goodness of fit, it will never be hurt from the addition of new variables. So if I have in my head that I want the, uh, the highest R squared possible because my instructor told me this is a measure of goodness of fit, higher R squared is better. Well, if we look at how it's calculated, SSR, it's a sum of squared values. So there's nothing negative here. If I add new variables, even if they're not in any way significantly correlated with my dependent variable, there will always be what we call spurious correlation, just some amount, maybe, maybe microscopic, maybe even a small amount of just random, we call it spurious correlation with our dependent variable. Well, that random, that spurious correlation, that's going to contribute positively to SSR. And my R squared is going to go up, maybe at the fourth decimal, fifth decimal, maybe only a small amount, but it will never go down. So the adjusted R square is a penalized R square. It's a penalty for adding nonsense variables, for adding variables to your model that might contribute positively to your R squared, but don't really contribute in any meaningful way to your model. So we'll have there a, a penalty, a degrees of freedom penalty for the R squared. And you'll see that when we do that calculation. Now, the adjusted R squared relies on the R squared in its calculation. We don't have the R squared, so I cannot obtain the adjusted R squared yet. Okay, so coming down, okay, we've got a standard error observations, degrees of freedom. Okay, I'm in the ANOVA now. And so what can I do in the ANOVA? Well, degrees of freedom, that's that's relatively straightforward. All I need to know there is my sample size and the number of variables in our model. The degrees of freedom on regression is not n minus k. It is k minus 1. So this is the same as it was for our simple linear model. The simple linear model, we were always estimating two coefficients. We had one independent variable and so we were estimating one intercept and one slope. So it was always two minus one. And so our degrees of freedom there was always just one. But now in this multiple regression, k is now different. k is not two anymore. Because now I can see I'm estimating still an intercept, yes, but also one, two, three, four slopes, four partial slopes. So in total, I'm estimating now five coefficients. So k is now equal to five, which means my degrees of freedom on regression is going to be four. Now, error. Calculation here is the same as it was in module 14, n minus k. Well, here I have my sample size, 
I have 30 observations. K, we just figured out K is 5, so this is now 25 degrees of freedom. SST, this is, as always, N minus 1. So I have 30 observations, this is 29, and I can see it's also equal to the sum of the degrees of freedom above it. 25 plus 4 is also 29. Good, so we've got something, finally. We've got our degrees of freedom. Now what can I do with our degrees of freedom? So I can use, I've got that mean squared regression and I have the degrees of freedom. I know, whoops, I know that mean squared value. Let me just zoom back out a little bit here. I know that mean squared regression, that was SSR over its degrees of freedom k minus 1. So I can use that relationship to solve for SSR. So if I take its MSR, 103851.04, and multiply by 4, so that gives me my sum of squared regression here is 41504.7. Okay, so I've got that sum of squared regression. Now I kind of feel like I hit a dead end here because I look at the next rows and what can I possibly do there? Well, this one's a little bit tricky because maybe we've forgotten about the fact that we have that standard error. How can I use that standard error at this point? Well, remember, that standard error, that's the square root of MSE. Ah, oh, okay, well, I can use that because if I want to solve for MSE, I just need to square both sides of that equation. So MSE is going to be the standard error, 88.71 squared. So MSE is 7869.47. Okay, now we can use that same relationship that we did here. If I just replace those R's with E's, and of course this with the appropriate degrees of freedom, N minus K, well now I can solve for SSE. So SSE is going to be equal to MSE, which is 7869.46, times its degrees of freedom, 25, and that gives me SSE is 19.6736.5. Good. Let's finish off that. We've got SST. So I'm just adding those two together. SSE to SSR. 415.404.16. SST is 612. 140.66. Okay, now I've got a couple of things that I can do here. I can get our F statistic. This is the same as it was for even a module 13 ANOVA, module 14 ANOVA, they're all the same. So I'm going to take MSR, which is 103,851.04, divided by MSE. 7869.46, and so that gives me my F of 13, I'll round it 13.2. And we could confirm, if we wanted to look at our F tables, we could confirm a p-value of zero. In fact, it's going to be zero to many decimal places, I suspect. Okay, we actually can now go back up to our regression statistics because now I've got enough information to obtain that R squared. I have SSR, which is 415.404.16, divided by SST, which is 612.140.66, and that gives me an R squared, oops, that gives me an R squared of 0.6, I'll round it, 0.68. Okay, now I can get everything else in there. That multiple R, 
That's the square root of the r squared. That gives me 0.82. The adjusted r square, let me just clean up a little space here so I can put in the equation. So the adjusted r square, which often is denoted r squared adj, this is 1 minus 1 minus the r squared over n minus 1, n minus k. So here we can see there's that degrees of freedom penalty. It's in that k value. So if I'm adding more and more and more independent variables, each independent variable that I add increases k by 1. So of course, it has to increase the r squared as well by enough to offset that increase in that uh, degrees of freedom penalty. So if I calculate this, that 1 minus my r squared, the r squared I have is 0.68, multiplied n minus 1, that's 29, over n minus k is 25. And so that gives me 0.37. So this is 1 minus 0.3712. And that gives me 0 0.6, I'll round it 0.63. Sometimes rounding the adjusted r squared can be problematic. For the sake of this problem, it's not an issue. But if we were building a model and we were going to add variables, take variables away, if we were working on building what we think is the best model, then of course we want to be monitoring the adjusted R squared for any, any changes. Sometimes changes to the R squared will happen at the third or fourth or fifth decimal place. So sometimes rounding that can be problematic because it hides potential improvements that you've made. For the sake of this problem, I'm not going to worry about that. Okay, so let's move on. Now we've got our ANOVA, we've got our regression statistics. Now we can come back here and fill in the rest. So you can see here now we've got a, a bigger table. And again, it's because we have more independent variables. For the simple linear regression, there was only the intercept and one coefficient, one slope. Now we have the intercept and we have four slopes. So let's get into calculating what's missing here. Starting off, on the intercept, I'm missing the coefficient. I see that I have the interval. I have the lower and the upper limit on the interval. The coefficient, just like we did in module 14, that coefficient is exactly in the middle of that interval. So if I have that interval is 241.71, the upper limit is 1027.31, if I look at the middle of that, so I'm just adding them together, divide by two, well that gives me my coefficient 634.51. Okay, now what about standard error in t-stat? Well, we did a practice problem like this, similar to this, in module 14. Because here again, I have that interval, that coefficient is in the middle, which we just solved for 634.51. I have a lower limit, and I have an upper limit. Well, the relationship between that, that point estimate in the middle and either of the, the limits on lower end or upper end it's exactly the same as it was in the simple linear regression. That formula is the point estimate plus or minus some critical value with how many degrees of freedom always corresponds with our estimate of the variance, which here we have n minus k degrees of freedom, times the standard error of the estimate. Now, we could in module 14, we could calculate all of this stuff from the data set. Here we can't, but what I do know is that the upper limit, so if I look at the upper limit, 
well, I don't need to do that. Let's go like this. The upper limit of 1027.31, well, that's my point estimate, 634.51, plus some critical value from the t-distribution. So if we're doing this, these are 95%. We have 25 degrees of freedom. So if I go to my t-tables, and here I have 25 degrees of freedom, and alpha, this is alpha divided by two because it's an interval. So there's 0.025 there. And so we come down, and so here's that critical T, 2.06. So that's 2.06 times that standard error. So once more, I'm using these known relationships between all of these values, working with those, working with how I know they're related to solve for those bits that are missing. So I'm going to solve for that that standard error, so that's 1027.31 minus 634.51 divided by 2.06. Whoops, I hit that button twice, which is always the mistake students make. Not necessarily hitting the button twice, but silly little calculation errors using their calculators. It's just too easy. Minus that divided by 2.06. So I have a standard error of 190.68. Good. Now I can get that missing T stat, 634.51, because again, those test statistics, it's the same. Same as it has always been. Point estimate divided by its standard error. It's the same as it's been since module nine. The details of the calculation are a little bit different, but that structure is the same. Point estimate divided by that standard error. So 634.51 divided by 190.68, and that gives me a t-stat 3.33. And you could look up and confirm a p-value of zero. Okay, let's move on. Price. So I've got a coefficient, I've got a standard error. I can find that T stat 784 divided by 175. That gives me a T stat of 4.48. That interval, well, the interval for all of those slopes follow this same structure. And so here I've already obtained the critical value for all of those confidence intervals. It's the same critical value for all of those confidence intervals. So if I'm working on this one, that point estimate, let's just clear some space here. That point estimate is minus 784 <clears throat> plus or minus that same critical T it was 2.06 times that standard error, which I'm using this one here, 1.75. So 7.84 plus, oh, that's a negative 784, plus 2.06 times 175. So there I have that upper limit is negative 4.235. And now my lower limit, 784 negative minus 2.06 times 175 negative 1, oh no, that's 11.45. Okay, so that's it. We've got our intervals, uh, first two intervals done. Now let's look at the next one, price of a related good what do we have? I've got the coefficient. I've only got one of the interval limits. So what can I do there? Again, I'm just going to keep using this relationship. Here I can see that upper limit is negative 5.45. So that upper limit came from 
the calculation of here's that point estimate, minus 1014, plus, because it's the upper limit, so that's the plus, that same t times the missing standard error. Okay, so I have 5.05 .05 negative plus 1014 divided by 2.06, and so that gives me that standard error of 2.28. Now I can get my t statistic, 1014 divided by 228, that's negative 445. Oh, I want that lower limit uh, for that confidence interval. And there's a couple of different ways we could probably go about doing this. Because again, here I have the point estimate, minus 10.14. And I have an upper limit is negative 5.45. Well, I know that this difference is identical to that difference. So I can use those two known values to calculate the margin of error. So if I look at that difference between 1014 and 545, well, that gives me a margin of error of 4.69. So I can take that point estimate negative 1014, subtract that margin of error, and that gives me my lower limit of 1483. Or I could have just used this calculation again as well. So we had a couple of options for that one. So here I have negative 14.83. Okay, we're almost done, and then I think I'll start another video to finish off this one. This is taking longer than anticipated. So this next row on advertising, it's similar to the one we just did. I've got the standard error, and I've got just the upper limit. So for this one, I'm going to have the upper limit. Why don't I just refresh this? I have the upper limit is 11.53. Okay, I'm looking at this value here. That came from the point estimate. That point estimate B3, doesn't really matter what I call it, plus that critical T times that standard error. So, different ingredients for that same calculation. So here I'm going to have 11.53 minus 2.06 times 1.8 and so that gives me my coefficient of 782. Now I can get my t-stat 782 divided by 1.8 4.35, I can get that lower limit. Again, I know the size of that margin of error. I have the upper limit was 11.53. I have my point estimate is 7.82. So that margin of error in this one, that margin of error is 371, which means that this difference here is also 371. So 782 minus 371 gives me a lower limit of 4.11. Okay, last one. Here I've got the coefficient and I've got a T stat. I can take advantage of this formula to figure out what the standard error is. So that standard error is just going to be 5.1 divided by 1.72 and that gives me 2 point, let's round it, 2.97. Why don't we calculate that lower limit a slightly different way? 
We'll just use this formula here this time instead of working with the margin of error, which we could obtain the margin of error again. But now I want that lower limit is my point estimate, 5.1, minus that critical value times that standard error, 5.1 minus 2.06 times 2.97, and there I have negative 1.02. Done. We filled in everything. So from this, and this is where I will finish this video and then we'll come back and deal with some interpretations. Here I can get now finally that estimated regression equation y hat, our intercept is 634.51 minus 784 times px minus 1014 py plus 782 advertising plus 5.10 income. So there, finally, after all of this, there is our key result. The purpose for doing all of this is to get that estimated regression equation. Because from there, now, we can figure out the goodness of fit, we can interpret these, we can perform testing, all of those things that we've done. Same as module 14 type problems. Okay, I'm gonna end this video here and then we'll come back and we'll do another one to finish this off. Okay, thanks for watching everybody, bye-bye.